I'm Giovanni Camorati. And I'm Marius Munch. And as introduced, we are here to talk about screaming channels. Sorry for the small delay. There were some technical problems, but now we start right ahead. Yes, we are two PhD students in Eurocom. Uh, it's a university in southern France, in Côte d'Azur. And uh, we did this project with our colleagues, uh, Sebastian Peuplau, Thomas Ace, and our supervisor, Aurélien Francillon. But I can imagine a lot of you here came to the room, maybe read the abstract, something about AES, 10 meters, side channels attack. So let's just get you in the mood. Like, what is this talk going to be about? What will you hear and see in the next 45 minutes? So first of all, it's about a new kind uh, or a new way of uh, electromagnetic side channel attacks possible from a distance. It's about our story, how we got there, and how we discovered it, and how we made it working in a distance up to 10 meter, which uh, we will explain later why it is impressive. And we will even have like a small demo set up here, which we will show. And last but not least, we are going to tell you where to go from here, what to do. But let's start from the beginning. So, as we know, nowadays life is mostly and mostly more dependent on AF communication and in a lot of small devices with the rise of the so-called Internet of Things and similar things. So imagine, for instance, you have a smart lock and your phone and you will just, you know, come home, pass with your phone and the smart lock will identify your home and open. Obviously, there's not much magic involved in the end. Like, there's, at the end of the day, on the smart lock, just an ordinary microchip. Yes, and one of the most popular architectures for those kind of uh, chips is the so-called mixed signal architecture, in which, as you can see in the image, uh, there is uh, the digital logic, the processor on which the application software is running, uh, on the same silicon die as uh, the radio, the analog components of the radio, for some uh, popular uh, wireless protocol. For example, in this, in this example, we have a Bluetooth uh, communication with uh, the phone. But once we have a channel, we also want to secure it. So we want to run some uh, encryption, for example, AES, software AES. And as we know from conventional side channel attacks, running such software produces uh, noise, which is actually correlated with the data being processed. Here you can see, for example, a um, uh, signature of AES with the key schedule and the first round. But what is special here is that because of the close physical proximity between the digital logic and the analog logic of the radio, this noise flows from one side uh, to the other because there is some pass between the two. So it is picked up by the radio and it is eventually transmitted over the air. And that this noise is transmitted and contains some like sensitive information is the new part about screaming channels in the end. Like just that we abuse it, that we sit on the other end or with our software defined radio, some signal processing software, and in the end get out the secret key used for the encryption on the device. And please note here the device doesn't have to send any encrypted message at all. It's enough that the device uh, encrypts while sending. And that's more or less the high level overview about screaming channels, but now let's go uh, from the beginning in a little bit more of detail. Yes, and to understand all our uh, project, we need some background that we will give you, so let's start with something on side channel attacks. Exactly, so I guess the most, or, or yeah, probably the most of people of you are familiar with side channel attacks, and let me just really wrap it up for those who are not. In essence, like even provably secure cryptographic algorithms have to run on hardware at some point in time to actually do things, right? And one big problem we have is that hardware is not perfect. Hardware may leak, like based on the intermediate computations. Like for instance, uh, it has different timings or different uh, power consumption based for intermediate values it uses during computation. And when we as attacker are able to abuse it and construct some signal or some original cryptographic secrets out of this uh, data leak or leaks over side channels, we speak of a side channel attack. And just to put it in context, like one very famous uh, device used to carry out side channel attack, who knows what this is? Hands up. Yeah, exactly, it's a chip whisperer. And uh, we use it also, or we use software of it also for our attack, so just uh, some notion here. Okay. Yes, but how does uh, the attack actually work? How can we recover the key from, from this noise? So we will present uh, 
So sorry. <laughs> we will first uh, give you some basics of electromagnetic side channels. Go, Mari. Sorry, my fault. Oh, um, what? sorry. That's why. That's the electromagnetic. I, I don't. Okay, so the idea is that uh, electromagnetic side channels are uh, one of the uh, one of the types of side channel attacks, and the idea is that because uh, logic, logic switches, it consumes current, and current variations produce some electromagnetic uh, fields that we can try to use to attack. And we will not be really exhaustive, but we want to give you a few uh, attacks, uh, example of attacks, just to give you an idea of what's possible up to now. So, for example, on smart cards and laptops, we can do attacks at about 50. 15 centimeters uh, of distance. And there is a very famous uh, attack called Tempest on monitors. Uh, here we can uh, recover what is being projected on the screen up to, to five meters. But in this case, it is not an attack against uh, cryptography. It's just uh, recovering, well, just, but it's recovering the image uh, projected on the screen. But how can we actually recover a key when we perform a side channel attack. So one of the simplest attacks that we can imagine is the so-called correlation attack. There are many more. And let's see what do we need to do to do that. So first we need to know the plain text or also the cipher text would, would work. Then we need a nonlinear relationship between the key, the plain text, and some internal state of the algorithm, some internal computation. So let me give you an example. This is the first round of AS, and you can see a byte of the plain text, which is XORed uh, with a byte of the key and enters a highly nonlinear uh, function called SBOX, and its output is uh, the state. Then what we need is a linear relationship between this state and the leak. So for example, if we measure the electromagnetic side channel or if we measure power consumption, uh, what we measure will be linearly correlated with, somehow linearly correlated with uh, this state. And this relationship between key plain text and this internal state, it's what we call the leak model because it lets us predict which will be the leak for a given computation. But let's now try to actually perform the attack step by step. First, we need to encrypt many, many times with known plain texts and collect the corresponding uh, leaks, as you can see in the scheme. Then we want to guess uh, one byte of the key, as you can see here. And once we know this guess, the plain text and the S box, we can compute the, uh, the values of the state for this guess. And then to decide whether this guess was correct or wrong, we can just check the linear dependency between uh, the measured leak and this guess, this computed guess. And if the guess was correct, well, of course, they would be linearly correlated. And if instead the guess was wrong, uh, since the S box is highly nonlinear, a little mistake in the guess would produce a big mistake in uh, the computed values. Here, we tried to represent it by shuffling the colored uh, squares. So they're shuffled, they're not linearly uh, dependent with the uh, leak anymore, and we can then see that this key is wrong. So to complete the attack, we just need to repeat this for each possible value of the guess and for each possible key. So here is the algorithm. For each possible, uh, for each byte of uh, the key, for each possible value of this byte, we compute the correlation between the leak and the guess that we did, that we computed, and uh, we choose the one which has the best correlation as the best guess for our byte. And what I want to point out here is that uh, since we are attacking step by step, byte by byte, uh, the attack is manageable in complexity. And that's possible only thanks to the leak, which give, uh, gives us an insight on an internal state of the algorithm, which is instead secure if we look at it from a mathematical point of view as a whole. But now let's move on to a different kind of background, like completely uh, different, a little bit about uh, AF communications. So this is a sine wave, uh, pretty easy. It uh, like moves over a distance over time and it has a certain amplitude, which is like the peak of the wave and uh, the, the distance between um, two of those peaks is called uh, the wavelengths. 
and how like waves are propagating is traditionally calculated like uh, lambda, the wavelength is equal to velocity divided uh, by the frequency. And as we're dealing with uh, electromagnetic waves or radio waves, uh, yeah, air waves, uh, the velocity is just the speed of light t. So we can directly see a correlation between the wavelengths and the amplitude. Another way to look uh, at the wave is in the power spectrum. So there we would have like uh, the frequency aligns on the x axis, and depending on how high it goes, the more like intense is this frequency in the spectrum over different frequencies. Important to know for the rest of our talk is a little bit how modulation works. So basically, like the main idea of modulation is you have a information, like in this case, an analog information, which you somehow want to transmit over the air. So what you will do, you will put a carrier wave, uh, which is just like one cyclic, very boring wave. Uh, you will generate it like with an oscillator most of the times. You mix those two together, and at the end, you have, uh, in this case, an amplitude, uh, amplitude modulated wave uh, looking somewhat like this. So you have uh, the information signal modulated over your carrier wave. And in the power spectrum, this looks kind of interesting because now you don't even only see the carrier wave, but also the information signal uh, on the side of them at a certain offset. So that's just a very, very brief introduction to RF for understanding later graphs in our presentation. Yes, now we will give some background on mixed signal chips. Uh, mixed signal chips are extremely popular. They are in many devices for many wireless protocols. Uh, for example, I brought here a smartwatch and it's using Bluetooth and most likely it has a mixed signal chip in it and also other devices like presenters or keyboards and uh, many, many, many different uh, technologies. And why are they uh, so popular? Well, they're so popular because the idea of combining uh, the digital logic and the analog radio on the silicon, same silicon chip has a lot of benefits, a lot of advantages. It is power efficient, it is uh, easy to uh, integrate in uh, larger systems because the developers can just, uh, you know, take this single chip with a single SDK and uh, program their application and have access to a uh, very power efficient and cheap uh, radio for wireless communication. But unfortunately, uh, the designers of such systems have to face a, a big challenge, which is noise. And why? Because digital logic is by nature uh, very noisy. It's very noisy because values are switching between zeros and ones, and from an electrical point of view, these are uh, extreme values, and sharp changes produce uh, spurious emissions. Then the close proximity, the short distance, the fact that digital logic and analog logic are built on the same silicon die facilitates the propagation of this noise from one side to the other. And unfortunately, the analog components that made uh, the radio are uh, very sensitive, again, by nature, to noise. And I want to point out that we are talking about digital, modern digital uh, wireless protocols, but still the components that uh, compose the radio are analog components and they are sensitive to this noise. So the designers of uh, those chips have to make sure that the radio still works even in presence of uh, this aggressive digital part. But our hypothesis was, uh, what about the actual information that is present in this noise? Let's not just think about it from a functional point of view, let's think about it from a security point of view. So what if this sensitive information is picked up by the radio, transmitted, and we can perform a side channel attack from a large distance, larger than, than before? Yeah, so we had this idea, and that's basically a little bit like how our journey began. But we didn't know where to start, checking because there were just so many different variables like for instance what kind of devices should we look like uh, look at should we watch at bluetooth devices at wi-fi devices gsm what kind of firmware should they run should we look for uh, hardware IAS encryption or software uh, encryptions uh, what kind of like like how would the noise propagate on which amplitudes or like is it on the amplitude is it in the face of the signal is it on certain frequencies so we really had a lot of things to test out and then to figure out and it took us a while and after a couple of months of really trying around we have tried out several chips uh, several things we came up with a custom firmware just to prove like basic things working or not we found accidentally one of those leaks 
while accidentally, well, we just tuned on, on the wrong frequency. We did some math wrong and uh, ended up listening on the wrong frequency, and suddenly there was a leak, which we could observe, and this leak was dependent on our computations. Amazing. So let's have a little look at it, how it looks like. So this was more or less uh, our setup. We had a firmware which could uh, transmit or not transmit in a continuous wave mode. So this is basically a test mode which will just send out one wave, no actual packets. The chip which we used in this scenario was a popular Bluetooth chip. And we will just, inside the firmware, like trigger different loops, like either a fast loop or a slow loop, as we call it. And the fast loop, or the slow loop is basically the same as a fast loop with some additional knobs in between to just sp uh, spend more time before the loop actually reiterates. And yeah, this would be controlled over serial. And what we saw is something like that, uh, like on some sidebands of the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, which is like the main Bluetooth frequency, we saw those kind of leaks. And we wanted to see what's going on. So what we did first is we took a spectrum analyzer, so a device which would put us uh, the full power spectrum and not just um, some sidebands or some closed bands, so like a normal software-defined radio, and hook it up very close to the device, to our Bluetooth chip communicating. So what we will see first, if, if we run the different loops, uh, we will see that the red arrows here, like the leaks, are moving, depending on what, which loop um, is running. And if we now, like, would put the spectrum analyzer farther away, uh, we would also, oh, of course, sorry, I forgot to mention that. That was the conventional electromagnetic leak we saw there. And if we now go farther away, uh, we can see the same leaks happening from a distance, like, uh, and at the 2.4 gigahertz band. Like, it's behaving exactly the same as a traditional electromagnetic uh, side channel leak. So with that, we could actually start and trying to understand what was going on here. So, what we, we figured out is that there are two main modulation stages. Uh, so, first, the loop is spinning at a fixed frequency, so it's producing a noise which has a fixed frequency component. That's the red arrow, arrow you can see in the leftmost spectrogram. And this digital noise at a fixed frequency, it's somehow mixed with the clock signal of the chip at 64 megahertz. So what happens is that this clock is modulated by uh, the noise, and in other words, the noise is brought up to 64 megahertz, and you can see it in the second uh, spec uh, spectrum plot. And what's special in, uh, in screaming channels is that this noise, because of the proximity between the two parts, flows to the analog radio, and here it is mixed once more. And this time it is mixed with the carrier of the protocol, and in this case we have a Bluetooth carrier at uh, 2.4 gigahertz. So this carrier is modulated, or again, the noise is brought up to 2.4 gigahertz. And what do we have in the end is that the information, the sensitive information is spread all over the spectrum, as you can see. But let's now focus on the left part of the scheme, on the conventional part, the one that uh, traditional, conventional side channel attacks uh, use. And the first thing we want to, uh, to understand is why actually executing software produces some noise which is uh, correlated with the data. Well, to do that, we have to think that in the end, uh, software execution uh, is uh, the switching of some logic gates inside the digital logic of the processor. And in this slide, you can see an inverter which acts as a not logic function. So the output, the green output, is the inversion of the input on the left. And since this is a real a physical component, we need a power supply and a ground to power, up, uh, power it, it up. So let's imagine that we want to switch uh, the output from 0 to 1. Unfortunately, this is a real physical component. On the output, we have a parasitic capacitance. And for those who are not familiar with electronics, just think it about it as a reservoir, as a pot. And if we want to bring the value to 1, we need to fill this reservoir with current. So we provide some current from the power supply, and there is a spike, and the capacitance uh, charges itself, and in the end, the output uh, is 1. If instead we don't switch at all, well, there will be no power consumption. And if we want to switch back from 1 to 0, we need to discharge this capacitance to ground, 
So this time there will be no current flowing from the power supply to the capacitance. And in both cases there is a very little parasitic current going directly from the power supply to the ground. Uh, it's not really important. But what you see in the end is that depending we are switching or not, and if we are switching depending on the uh, side of the, the, the switching, uh, the current consumption is different. So somehow there is a relationship between the logic values uh, that are being processed in the program and the current consumption in the chip. And let's now to try to understand why mixing occurs. There are several ways. Uh, the first one is here in this slide. You can see a data line. The data line uh, is switching and it switches depending on the logic values. And the frequency at which it switches, if it is switching, depends on the clock. You can see uh, there is a memory element, a flip-flop, uh, that is synchronized by the clock signal. So we could see this as actually the modulation between a carrier, which is somehow related to the clock frequency, and an information signal, which is uh, saying, okay, the logic value is switching or not switching. Another way is the presence of nonlinear components in the system. So here you can see a transistor in a saturation region and the output current, the red uh, signal at the output, is quadratic with the voltage at the input. So if, for example, we provide a sum of two signals at the input, as you can see from the equation, at the output we will have approximately the multiplication of the two and multiplication, mixing, amplitude modulation are all the same thing. So we will have that these components act as mixers. And let's now go to what is specific to screaming channels. Exactly, like for screaming channels, like the important thing is that this classical leak also like from the digital domains propagates to the analog domain. And then it gets mixed up again by the radio and sent over the air. So how does it propagate? Like we have multiple theories and uh, the two most likely are is that it either happens via substrate coupling or power supply coupling. So substrate coupling basically means if we do our like, like chips, we would use some substrate, usually silicon, uh, which we place as a basis and put all the tiny digital and analog components on it, very simply spoken. And the silicon or substrate itself is normally not meant to be conducting because it just, you know, there for separation, but under certain circumstances, it can propagate some nice soap be a tiny bit conducting on certain frequencies, and this is known as substrate coupling and could be one of the reasons why the digital noise propagates to the analog domain. The other reason power supply coupling is basically the idea that um, they could be, for instance, like uh, very obviously connected to the same power source. So if one part uh, consumes a little bit more of power, you would see reflections on that on the analog part as well. Um, note here, like this is very like, like the most obvious thing, like power supply coupling can also happen on different other levels. Like for instance, we are even on PCB level, like farther behind in the chain. And so how does, uh, like we have this coupling, how does it get mixed uh, into our signal, which we can pick up on the other hand? So if we will, uh, on the other hand, if we will go for um, substrate coupling, it's very lighter, uh, very likely that it gets picked up by the VCO, the voltage controlled oscillator, which is here in the block diagram uh, on the very, let me see, on the very left of you, which basically con uh, creates our carrier wave for our signal coming on. Behind that, we have a mixer and the power amplifier would like amplify uh, the full signal, the, the mixed signal with information to send it over the air. And if we would deal with power supply coupling, we would uh, have the mixing in there in the power amplifier. And then there are like, as I said, that are just our two most likely uh, series. Uh, there can be like, a tons of other reasons which we haven't explored yet, but at least they fit our model so far. And uh, there's for sure a little bit more to explore on how digital noise can leak over or propagate to the analog domain. So to sum up, the noise which is dependent on the data is generated when logic, uh, logic gates switch. Then it's modulated with the clock signal and then it propagates to the uh, radio part where it modulates the carrier and in the end we have a spectrum that looks like that with the actual sensitive information spread all over the spectrum. 
And now that we know that, like, how are we actually building an attack out of it? Like, we have all this background knowledge now. How how can we attack this? So um, remember the firmware from early on? We modified it a little bit so that it now, besides uh, running in simple loops and be able to transmit a continuous wave to also transmit like ordinary Bluetooth packets over the air and also to do AES encryptions or not. And what we here have is a waterfall plot. So we would have um, the signal over time over different frequencies and the more yellow like one part in this prop, uh, plot is, the more strong is the frequency there. So if we have uh, the radio off, like we're not transmitting anything, we don't see really much uh, on the plot. While if we turn the radio on, we uh, like suddenly see things in the spectrum. And if we put AES on, it gets a little bit messy. So in this graph, we can, or in this waterfall, we can see several things. So first of all, we pretty see uh, the wait loop. Like there's just the firmware looping and waiting. So it would be like a constant uh, signal on some frequency, similar to uh, our custom loops we saw before. Then we see the packet boundaries. Like we see when one Bluetooth packet is stopped to being sent because suddenly there on the spectrum is like this break. There's uh, no signal anymore. And last but not least, we see pretty clear where AES encryption starts. I mean, before the spectrum, like even with radio on, looked kind of harmonic. And now it's just very messy going all over the place. And if we go there and like look at one of those uh, messy places of signal and demodulate it, we will get uh, some graph, something like that, which is just uh, the frequency. And we see here, like we saw after spending considerable amount of time staring at those graphs, pretty clear AES in that blue graph. Because in there we have like 10 distinct spikes, which would correlate to the 10 distinct rounds of AES in the end. So this was all pretty much manual labor, like sitting there, writing code to plot us graphs and trying to see something. And we will need for an attack to actually work to automate all the steps. Yes, so let's see how. In the first subplot, you see the time domain. And in the second subplot, you see the same spectrogram as before, but this time it's a little bit zoomed. So in the time domain, you can clearly distinguish the packets. You see that between packets, there is no transmission at all. And with a little bit of imagination, you can also see the AES rounds. But this is even more clear in the spectrogram. And most of all, what is clear is that there are some frequency components that appear regularly before each encryption. So we could just tune into one of these components and use it as trigger. Each time it is on, it means that an encryption will start. And once we do, we do that, uh, we have the plot, uh, in the first plot here, so all the traces that we have extracted aligned together. If we want to improve the alignment, we can use self-correlation between the traces. And, and uh, once we have very aligned traces, there is still a lot of random noise over it. So we want to average it out. And if we average it, we obtain the second plot, which is an extremely clean trace of AES. And this was already recorded at uh, a large distance. Now I don't remember exactly, but uh, maybe 50 centimeters or something like this. So you can see it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty clear. And once we have those clear traces, what we can do is finally perform the attack. And uh, besides the correlation attack that I've explained before, uh, we also use template attack. It is based on the very same uh, leak model and the same principle, but it consists in an initial training phase with a large set of encryptions that we know, and then it works with a smaller set of attack traces. We attacked different implementations of AS, the one in embed TLS, for example, which is protected against some forms of timing side channels, but not against uh, electromagnetic side channels, and also tiny AS, which is a simpler, uh, simpler version. And the important thing, like all of this, the collection, extraction, and attacking code, we use, we made it public open source on GitHub. Uh, wait to the end of the talk to see the link, but you can take this and either reproduce at least the attack on traces we provide, or go out and collect your own traces. So that's pretty good, but just to give you a little bit of more visual context, like how our attack developed, like in the very beginning, we will just start 
like hooking up uh, the Bluetooth chip directly via a cable to our SDR. Uh, so that's pretty close. Then we would go like 15 centimeters and got it working, then maybe up to uh, one meter or two meter. Uh, this is still at home, like the two meters uh, at our place where we live. And well, at some point we run out of space uh, in this place because we just had walls. So luckily we found some people which had an unequal chamber, which was even more awesome for us because we would have like a standardized setting, a standardized room in which AF testing is done, so where there's no noise around. So we could scale up the attack uh, pretty easily. From three meter, we could go up to five and eventually to 10. And 10 meters, what is this? I think around 32 feet. So uh, this is uh, pretty impressive considering that this kind of side channels before were only possible to normally attack ranges uh, below one meter. So we went at least factor 10. And now it's time for a demo. So demo time. And while Giovanni sets up the demo, I will just like shortly explain the hardware which I brought. Can we have uh, the camera on the hardware please? Thanks. So we have here to, uh, to the very, Left, is this from you guys? Yes, uh, this blue board is basically uh, just some switchable USB hub, which allows us to power switch uh, the device behind it. It's not for the attack itself, very important, but it's uh, a convenience uh, feature for our proof of concept. Then up here, like the red guy, that's actually our Bluetooth chip, which we are using for transmitting, and uh, which is just, yeah, transmitting Bluetooth data and here, to uh, the very right, we have uh, software-defined radio, the Hack RF, which is uh, on the low range uh, end of equipment. And I think we are ready to go over to the demo. So to some difficulties, we just brought recorded traces instead of collecting them dry, uh, live. So we will just uh, show you an example with traces which we collected already beforehand, but in the very same setup, like in this fancy nice box. So. Uh, yeah, so here we will see uh, the beginning of the attack typing with different parameters. Like once again, this is open source, you can use it uh, on your own. And here we go, it runs the correlation attack. So for every single uh, byte of the key, it will like test all the different possible values and get the probability like how likely this is to get the right byte. So this is running now for a while. At which byte are we currently? 11? 11. So uh, as we are like in computer science, we are starting by, uh, with byte zero. We use a 16 byte AES key. So we will wait under the script, have 15 bytes. And here we are. It got correctly all the 16 bytes of the AES key used during the encryptions on the traces we collected. So yeah, that was just a correlation attack. The template attack can be checked out. And let's go on, like, where do we go from real? Like, let's conclude our talk. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the impact of what we have showed you. So um, this is a pretty general problem. Like, it's not limited to mixed circuits design. Um, it's, in fact, um, yeah, like, like applicable to every kind of digital device which is close to analog uh, radios. And I mean, this was, I think, or we assume this was already known in the SIGINT community. Remember Tempest, which we uh, told you before, like this is where documents from the 80s declassified in 2000, and they speak about different kinds of uh, how Tempest signals could propagate, so acoustics, uh, induction and one of the points is like uh, con uh, like 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 modulation on an intended signal, and every other point of the uh, is like described in the text here, and just this one point modulation of an intended signal like where it would have to be described there's just like the statement six lines redacted, so even in the declassified documents we could find hints that like at least for other hardware like non mixed signal chips like this could be kind of known. So now on the point of critics, right? Like you, you could sit there and say like, okay, you just showed us a proof of concept. You don't attack a real device. So what's the point? Why, why are you bothering? So, well, first one very general thing, like attacks get only better. 
and we have plenty of ideas how to improve this attack and how to get there to attack a real device. Like, what we have is just a very, very simple approach and a simple attack, and we could like really make the collection better because now we are over the air. So we, instead of just using one radio, you could, we could use multiple, or we could make our signal processing part better because this is pretty basic stuff for you to in the end. Or we just could also abuse like different weaknesses of protocols we are attacking, or of protocols used by the chips which we are attacking. And last but not least, in that sense, like we really felt like. Sharing that very early on or as early as possible to mitigate faster, to like protect against it faster, because this changes the threat model of uh, mixed signal chips in the end. Like uh, where before, like where electronic side channels just like on 15 centimeters distance possible, chip vendors would say, like, yeah. 15 centimeters, okay. If you're that close, you can do worse things. We shouldn't care. Or we don't need to care. It's not part of our threat model. Well, now with 10 meters, it gets, uh, gets considerable. So we disclosed this to multiple major chip vendors and uh, got acknowledgement from them. Like they acknowledged it's a general problem and we are right. And um, so, yeah, it's a general problem. And some of the chip vendors, uh, even trying actively or tried actively to reproduce our results like internally, like they set up small things on their own and we try to help them with that. And some of them are even, or one a special chip vendor is actively looking together with us into how to mitigate this in the short and in the long term and how to make things better. And what are the countermeasures? Just one small notion, we don't name any vendors here because it's a general problem and we don't want to blame any specific uh, chip vendor. But now up to the countermeasures. What could actually be the countermeasures? How could we protect against this kinds of attack? So we could think about very classic countermeasures, software or hardware ones, uh, which for example inject some kind of noise which decorrelates the measures from the data. But what we want to point out is that uh, this may be uh, expensive and we're talking about very cheap, uh, low end and cost, uh, sorry, power constrained devices. Uh, and also that once we start putting uh, more advanced defenses, we could also apply more advanced attacks than the one we used. Uh, more interestingly, there are some countermeasures which are specific to our channel, to our new attack vector. Uh, so the first one uh, regarding software would be to just uh, turn, off, turn off the radio while performing sensitive computations. This would just uh, kill the channel. But at the same time, it may be difficult if there are uh, strict timing constraints. And on the hardware side, what we could do is uh, try to uh, consider the security implications of noise, the actual information that is present in the noise during the design and test of, uh, of the chips, uh, instead of just considering the noise from a functional point of view. And that's basically our talk so far, like let's uh, proceed to the sound bites, like what can you take home from this talk? So the first and very important thing, which, which I think really we should keep in mind is that everything is analog. Like even we think of digital logic as zeros at once, they have to, like this digital logic in the end is just analog hardware as well, which produces noise and so on. So we have to keep that in mind for uh, when, when we look at like side channels and so on, different kinds of attack. Yes, and the last two bytes are that uh, digital noise uh, can leak uh, sensitive information into the analog radio so that in the end we can perform side channel attacks from a very large uh, distance. And with that, we want to thank you for your attention. You can shoot questions to us like now we are mail, we are Twitter, later in the wrap up room. Uh, you can see our code uh, and more information about all of this on the links. Uh, we have tiny QR codes, and then you can also give feedback to this talk. And I think that's it. Floor's open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a, a first question, perhaps. OK. Um, uh, can, can we dim the lights? I don't see where you are. Ah, OK, perfect. Thanks. Over here. Good. So you mentioned that noise can be transmitted through the um, 
through the, the silicon or through the power supply, right? Yes. Um, what about the actual electromagnetic uh, emissions uh, that are used for an electromagnetic side channel attacks? Could they, essentially what I'm trying to ask is if, if, you don't, if you're not on the same silicon die, could you still have leakage onto a radio that's on a different chip but on the same PCB? Um, so to repeat the question of whether like the leakage we observed is only um, based on the fact that the things are on the same silicon die, like that the electromagnetic emanations only get uh, propagated over um, the silicon die. And I would say the answer to that is uh, not like, like for sure substrate coupling only works on the same silicon die because it has to be on the same silicon. But for instance, power supply coupling can pretty much happen uh, on any level on the PCB dependent on the chip design. So uh, that could happen as well, yes. So we focused on the uh, mixed, si mixed signal chips. We haven't tried other configurations, but they may. They may have the same problem. Another question here. Here? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that this is a, a possible exploit for Bluetooth. Uh, and uh, I understand Bluetooth is a uh, random frequency hopping, spread spectrum frequency hopping. So how would you pick up uh, these uh, side artifacts on, on uh, Bluetooth, given that the carrier frequency is at a random place at any one time? Yeah, so just to briefly repeat this, like we are attacking or we showed an attack on Bluetooth and Bluetooth deployed frequency hopping as optimization to carry over the signal. And how would we deal with that? So the idea is that uh, each time there is a carrier on, it's like it's opening a window over what's happening on the chip and we can listen to it. So if this carrier changes over time because of hopping, what we could uh, do is uh, listen on a wider uh, bandwidth and demodulate each of, of, the, of the carrier, the one which is on at a given instant in time, or even use uh, you know, multiple receivers really in parallel tuned onto different uh, frequencies. The point is that we know which, uh, which they are. And uh, actually talking about this, uh, there is a related project that we did in the group which uh, used parallel receivers uh, to cope with frequency hopping when sniffing the Bluetooth packets. So we are pretty confident that we could apply those techniques to make the attack working also in, in those conditions. Or we could even just listen to one single uh, carrier like we do now, but it would take more time because the window would be on, let's say, for a smaller uh, amount of time. So we would have the window over the encryption uh, will be rare. Um, so, just once, oh, sorry. Yeah, so the, the clock frequency though, the 64 megahertz is invariant at all times. Did you look at how far that propagates? Uh, obviously right next to the chip you could see it, but does it go any distance at all? Did you look? So um, the question is whether the clock frequency, like on like like the 64 megahertz leak, it will, like how far does it propagate? Um, well, for uh, conventional side channel attacks, uh, we looked at literature for the values they 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 say they declare. Uh, well, with our experiments, uh, we saw something interesting: is that actually uh, that also that frequency propagates to the radio part, and it's. Uh, amplified by the amplifier of the radio. So thanks to that, when we were turning the radio on, we were able to look at that signal from a distance, I don't know, for example, of some tens of centimeters. And when the radio was off, uh, we would have had to use, uh, we had to use uh, small coil antennas and amplifiers that were not necessary uh, in the case of, of the transmission on. But to go up to 10 meters, we had to move to the main frequency. And the reason is that th at that frequency, uh, the components in the, in the circuit, in the system, are meant to transmit. So the power into play is, is bigger. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and now just a short addition like that. We attack Bluetooth in the specific instances, whether due to historic reasons or due to chance, because that was the first chip where we actually could easily see something. And after we got that working, we saw indications, like we didn't 100% confirm like the same leaks, but we saw indication of those leaks also, for instance, on Wi-Fi chips. But this is something we will investigate in the future. 
Hi, question over here. Yes. Um, for the future steps, just out of curiosity, have you guys researched into picking this up not with an SDR, but maybe with like a phone as well? Or would that be possible? So the question is, if, if I understood it right, whether we just want for the future work only go to STR or, only, or also will try to like enable normal COTS hardware like a telephone to pick up those signals and noise. And I, so we were not really planning on doing that and I don't know if it's possible to be honest. Yes, the, the SDRs and the lab equipment so like spectrum analyzers and so on are easier to use for automating the trace collection and so on. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much for talk. First of all, cool. Uh, but then I had actually like a long list of questions, but I'll just ask one right now and maybe they can talk later. If I understand correctly, you've only attacked a software version of AES, right? Um, okay, so we just got the sign that uh, we are out of time, like uh, looks like we are done. Uh, we will come and talk to you or just come here and we will see in the wrap up room, Excellent. sorry for that. Okay. And then we can also go through the full list. And once again, thank you all. Thank you.